chapter one of the legends of the jews volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the legends of the jews volume four by lewis ginsburg chapter one joshua the servant of moses the early history of the first jewish conqueror in some respects is like the early history of the first jewish legislator moses was rescued from a watery grave and raised at the court of egypt joshua in infancy was swallowed by a whale and wonderful to relate did not perish at a distant point of the sea-coast the monster spewed him forth unharmed he was found by compassionate passers-by and grew up ignorant of his descent the government appointed him to the office of hangman as luck would have it he had to execute his own father by the law of the land the wife of the dead man fell to the share of his executioner and joshua was on the point of adding to parricide another crime equally heinous he was saved by a miraculous sign when he approached his mother milk flowed from her breasts his suspicions were aroused and through the inquiries he set afoot regarding his origin the truth was made manifest later joshua who was so ignorant that he was called a fool became the minister of moses and god rewarded his faithful service by making him the successor to moses he was designated as such to moses when at the bidding of his master he was carrying on war with the amalekites in this campaign god's care of joshua was plainly seen joshua had condemned a portion of the amalekites to death by lot and the heavenly sword picked them out for extermination yet there was as great a difference between moses and joshua as between the sun and the moon god did not withdraw his help from joshua but he was by no means so close to him as to moses this appeared immediately after moses had passed away at the moment when the israelitish leader was setting out on his journey to the great beyond he summoned his successor and bade him put questions upon all points about which he felt uncertain conscious of his own industry and devotion joshua replied that he had no questions to ask seeing that he had carefully studied the teachings of moses straightway he forgot three hundred halakot and doubts assailed him concerning seven hundred others the people threatened joshua's life because he was not able to resolve their difficulties in the law it was vain to turn to god for the torah once revealed was subject to human not to heavenly authority directly after moses death god commanded joshua to go to war so that the people might forget its grievance against him but it is false to think that the great conqueror was nothing more than a military hero when god appeared to him to give him instructions concerning the war he found him with the book of deuteronomy in his hand whereupon god called to him be strong and of good courage the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth entering the promised land the first step in preparation for war was the selection of spies to guard against a repetition of what had happened to moses joshua chose as his messengers caleb and phineas on whom he could place dependence in all circumstances they were accompanied on their mission by two demons the husbands of the she-devils lilith and mala when joshua was planning his campaign these devils offered their services to him they proposed that they be sent out to reconnoitre the land joshua refused the offer but formed their appearance so frightfully that the residents of jericho was struck with fear of them in jericho the spies put up with rahab she had been leading an immoral life for forty years but at the approach of israel she paid homage to the true god lived the life of a pious convert and as the wife of joshua became the ancestress of eight prophets and of the prophetess huldah she had opportunity in her own house of beholding the wonders of god when the king's bailiffs came to make their investigations and rahab wanted to conceal the israelitish spies phineas calmed her with the words i am a priest and priests are like angels visible when they wish to be seen invisible when they do not wish to be seen 
after the return of the spies joshua decided to pass over the jordan the crossing of the river was the occasion for wonders the purpose of which was to clothe him with authority in the eyes of the people scarcely had the priests who at this solemn moment took the place of the levites as bearers of the ark set foot in the jordan when the waters of the river were piled up to a height of three hundred miles all the peoples of the earth were witnesses of the wonder in the bed of the jordan joshua assembled the people around the ark a divine miracle caused the narrow space between its staves to contain the whole concourse joshua then proclaimed the conditions under which god would give palestine to the israelites and he added if these conditions were not accepted the waters of the jordan would descend straight upon them then they marched through the river when the people arrived on the further shore the holy ark which had all the while been standing in the bed of the river set forward of itself and dragging the priests after it overtook the people the day continued eventful unassailed the israelites marched seventy miles to mount gerizim and mount ebal and there performed the ceremony bidden by moses in deuteronomy six of the tribes ascended mount gerizim and six mount ebal the priests and the levites grouped themselves about the holy ark in the vale between the two peaks with their faces turned toward gerizim the levites uttered the words happy the man that maketh no idol an abomination unto the lord and all the people answered amen after reciting twelve blessings similar to this in form the levites turned to mount ebal and recited twelve curses counterparts of the blessings to each of which the people responded again with amen thereupon an altar was erected on mount ebal with the stones each weighing forty sign which the israelites had taken from the bed of the river while passing through the jordan the altar was plastered with lime and the torah written upon it in seventy languages so that the heathen nations might have the opportunity of learning the law at the end it was said explicitly that the heathen outside of palestine if they would but abandon the worship of idols would be received kindly by the jews all this happened on one day on the same day on which the jordan was crossed and the assembly was held on gerizim and ebal the day on which the people arrived in gilgal where they left the stones of which the altar had been built at gilgal joshua performed the rite of circumcision on those born in the desert who had remained uncircumcised on account of the rough climate and for other reasons and here it was that the manna gave out it had ceased to fall at the death of moses but the supply that had been stored up had lasted some time longer as soon as the people were under the necessity of providing for their daily wants they grew negligent in the study of the torah therefore the angel admonished joshua to loose his shoes from off his feet for he was to mourn over the decline of the study of the torah and bare feet are a sign of mourning the angel reproached joshua in particular with having allowed the preparations for war to interfere with the study of the torah and with the ritual service neglect of the latter might be a venial sin but neglect of the former is worthy of condign punishment at the same time the angel assured joshua that he had come to aid him and he entreated joshua not to draw back from him like moses who had refused the good offices of the angel he who spoke to joshua was none other than the archangel michael conquest of the land joshua's first victory was the wonderful capture of jericho the whole of the city was declared anathema because it had been conquered on the sabbath day joshua reasoned that as the sabbath is holy so also that which conquered on the sabbath should be holy the brilliant victory was followed by the luckless defeat at ai in this engagement perished jair the son of manasseh whose loss was as great as if the majority of sanhedrin had been destroyed presently joshua discovered that the cause of the defeat was the sinfulness of israel brought upon it by achan who had laid hands on some of the spoils of jericho achan was a hardened transgressor and criminal from of old during the life of moses he had several times appropriated to his own use things that had been declared anathema and he had committed other crimes worthy of the death penalty before the israelites crossed the jordan god had not visited achan's sins upon the people as a whole because at that time it did not form a national unit yet but when achan abstracted an idol and all its appurtenances from jericho 
the misfortune of i followed at once joshua inquired of god why trouble had befallen israel but god refused to reply he was no tale-bearer the evil-doer who had caused the disaster would have to be singled out by lot joshua first of all summoned the high priest from the assembly of the people it appeared that while the other jewels in his breastplate gleamed bright the stone representing the tribe of judah was dim by lot achan was set apart from the members of his tribe achan however refused to submit to the decision by lot he said to joshua among all living men thou and phineas are the most pious yet if lots were cast concerning you two one or other of you would be declared guilty thy teacher moses has been dead scarcely one month and thou hast already begun to go astray for thou hast forgotten that a man's guilt can be proved only through two witnesses endued with the holy spirit joshua divined that the land was to be assigned to the tribes and families of israel by lot and he realized that nothing ought to be done to bring this method of deciding into disrepute he therefore tried to persuade achan to make a clean breast of his transgression meantime the judeans the tribesmen of achan rallied about him and throwing themselves upon the other tribes they wrought fearful havoc and bloodshed this determined achan to confess his sins the confession cost him his life but it saved him from losing his share in the world to come in spite of the reverses at ai the terror inspired by the israelites grew among the canaanitish peoples the gibeonites planned to circumvent the invaders and form an alliance with them now before joshua set out on his campaign he had issued three proclamations the nation that would leave canaan might depart unhindered the nation that would conclude peace with the israelites should do it at once and the nation that would choose war should make its preparations if the gibeonites had sued for the friendship of the jews when the proclamation came to their ears there would have been no need for subterfuges later but the canaanites had to see with their own eyes what manner of enemy awaited them and all the nations prepared for war the result was that the thirty-one kings of palestine perished as well as the satraps of many foreign kings who were proud to own possessions in the holy land only the girgashites departed out of palestine and as a reward for their docility god gave them africa as an inheritance the gibeonites deserved no better fate than all the rest for the covenant made with them rested upon a misapprehension yet joshua kept his promise to them in order to sanctify the name of god by showing the world how sacred an oath is to the israelites in the course of events it became obvious that the gibeonites were by no means worthy of being received into the jewish communion and david following joshua's example excluded them forever a sentence that will remain in force even in the messianic time the son obeys joshua the task of protecting the gibeonites involved in the offensive and defensive alliance made with them joshua fulfilled scrupulously he had hesitated for a moment whether to aid the gibeonites in their distress but the words of god sufficed to recall him to his duty god said to him if thou dost not bring near them that are far off thou wilt remove them that are near by god granted joshua peculiar favour in his conflict with the assailants of the gibeonites the hot hailstones which at moses intercession had remained suspended in the air when they were about to fall upon the egyptians were now cast down upon the canaanites then happened the great wonder of the sun standing still the sixth of the great wonders since the creation of the world the battle took place on a friday joshua knew it would pain the people deeply to be compelled to desecrate the holy sabbath day besides he noticed that the heathen were using sorcery to make the heavenly hosts intercede for them in the fight against the israelites he therefore pronounced the name of the lord and the sun moon and stars stood still the sun at first refused to obey joshua's behest seeing that he was older than man by two days joshua replied that there was no reason why a free-born youth should refrain from enjoining silence upon an old slave whom he owns and had not god given heaven and earth to our father abraham nay more than this had not the son himself bowed down like a slave before joseph but said the son who will praise god if i am silent whereupon joshua be thou silent and i will intone a song of praise and he sang thus 
one thou hast done mighty things o lord thou hast performed great deeds who is like unto thee my lips shall sing unto thy name two my goodness and my fortress my refuge i will sing a new song unto thee with thanksgiving i will sing unto thee thou art the strength of my salvation three all the kings of the earth shall praise thee the princes of the world shall sing unto thee the children of israel shall rejoice in thy salvation they shall sing and praise thy power for in thee o god did we trust we said thou art our god for thou wast our shelter and our strong tower against our enemies five to thee we cried and we were not ashamed in thee we trusted and we were delivered when we cried unto thee thou didst hear our voice thou didst deliver our souls from the sword six thou hast shown unto us thy mercy thou didst give unto us thy salvation thou didst rejoice our hearts with thy strength seven thou wentest forth for our salvation with the strength of thy arm thou didst redeem thy people thou didst console us from the heavens of thy holiness thou didst save us from tens of thousands eight sun and moon stood still in heaven and thou didst stand in thy wrath against our oppressors and thou didst execute thy judgments upon them nine all the princes of the earth stood up the kings of the nations had gathered themselves together they were not moved at thy presence they desired thy battles ten thou didst rise against them in thine anger and thou didst bring down thy wrath upon them thou didst destroy them in thy fury and thou didst ruin them in thy rage eleven nations raged from fear of thee kingdoms tottered because of thy wrath thou didst wound kings in the day of thine anger twelve thou didst pour out thy fury upon them thy wrathful anger took hold of them thou didst turn their iniquity upon them and thou didst cut them off in their wickedness thirteen they spread a trap they fell therein in the net they hid their foot was caught fourteen thine hand found all thine enemies who said through their sword they possessed the land through their arm they dwelt in the city fifteen thou didst fill their faces with shame thou didst bring their horns down to the ground sixteen thou didst terrify them in thy wrath and thou didst destroy them from before thee seventeen the earth quaked and trembled from the noise of thy thunder against them thou didst not withhold their souls from earth and thou didst bring down their lives to the grave eighteen thou didst pursue them in thy storm thou didst consume them in the whirlwind thou didst turn their rain into hail they fell in floods so that they could not rise nineteen their carcasses were like rubbish cast out in the middle of the streets twenty they were consumed and they perished before thee thou hast delivered thy people in thy might twenty-one therefore our hearts rejoice in thee our souls exult in thy salvation twenty-two our tongues shall relate thy might we will sing and praise thy wondrous works twenty-three for thou didst save us from our enemies thou didst deliver us from those who rose up against us thou didst destroy them from before us and depress them beneath our feet twenty four thus shall all thine enemies perish o lord and the wicked shall be like chaff driven by the wind and thy beloved shall be like trees planted by the waters war with the armenians joshua's victorious course did not end with the conquest of the land his war with the armenians after palestine was subdued marked the climax of his heroic deeds among the thirty-one kings whom joshua had slain there was one whose son shobach by name was king of armenia with the purpose of waging war with joshua he united the forty-five kings of persia and media and they were joined by the renowned hero japheth the allied kings in a letter informed joshua of their design against him as follows the noble distinguished council of the kings of persia and media to joshua peace thou wolf of the desert we well know what thou didst to our kinsmen thou didst destroy our palaces without pity thou didst slay young and old our fathers thou didst mow down with the sword and their cities thou didst turn into desert know then that in the space of thirty days we shall come to thee we the forty-five kings each having sixty thousand warriors under him all them armed with bows and arrows girt about with swords all of us skilled in the ways of war and with us the hero japheth prepare now for the combat and say not afterward that we took thee at unawares 
the messenger bearing the letter arrived on the day before the feast of weeks although joshua was greatly wrought up by the contents of the letter he kept his counsel until after the feast in order not to disturb the rejoicing of the people then at the conclusion of the feast he told the people of the message that had reached him so terrifying that even he the veteran warrior trembled at the heralded approach of the enemy nevertheless joshua determined to accept the challenge from the first words his reply was framed to show the heathen how little their fear possessed him whose trust was set in god the introduction to his epistle reads as follows in the name of the lord the god of israel who saps the strength of the iniquitous warrior and slays the rebellious sinner he breaks up the assemblies of marauding transgressors and he gathers together in council the pious and the just scattered abroad he the god of all gods the lord of all lords the god of abraham isaac and jacob god is the lord of war from me joshua the servant of god and from the holy and chosen congregation to the impious nations who pay worship to images and prostrate themselves before idols no peace unto you saith my god know that ye acted foolishly to awaken the slumbering lion to rouse up the lion's whelp to excite his wrath i am ready to pay you your recompense be ye prepared to meet me for within a week i shall be with you to slay your warriors to a man joshua goes on to recite all the wonders god had done for israel who need fear no power on earth and he ends his missive with the words if the hero japheth is with you we have in the midst of us the hero of heroes the highest above all the high the heathen were not a little alarmed at the tone of joshua's letter their terror grew when the messenger told of the exemplary discipline maintained in the israelitish army of the gigantic stature of joshua who stood five ells high of his royal apparel of his crown graven with the name of god at the end of seven days joshua appeared with twelve thousand troops when the mother of king shobach who was a powerful witch espied the host she exercised her magic art and enclosed the israelitish army in seven walls joshua thereupon sent forth a carrier pigeon to communicate his plight to nebiah the king of the transjordanic tribes he urged him to hasten to his help and bring the priest phineas and the sacred trumpets with him nebiah did not tarry before the relief detachment arrived his mother reported to shobach that she beheld a star arise out of the east against which her machinations were vain shobach threw his mother from the wall and he himself was soon afterward killed by nebiah meantime phineas arrived and at the sound of his trumpets the wall toppled down a pitched battle ensued and the heathen were annihilated allotment of the land at the end of seven years of warfare joshua could at last venture to parcel out the conquered land among the tribes this was the way he did it the high priest eleazar attended by joshua and all the people and arrayed in the urim and thummim stood before two urns one of the urns contained the names of the tribes the other the names of the districts into which the land was divided the holy spirit caused him to exclaim zebulon when he put his hand into the first urn lo he drew forth the word zebulon and from the other came the word akko meaning the district of akko thus it happened with each tribe in succession in order that the boundaries might remain fixed joshua had had the hazubah planted between the districts the rootstock of this plant once established in a spot it can be extirpated only with the greatest difficulty the plough may draw deep furrows over it yet it puts forth new shoots and grows up again amid the grain still marking the old division lines in connection with the allotment of the land joshua issued ten ordinances intended in a measure to restrict the rights in private property pasturage in the woods was to be free to the public at large any one was permitted to gather up bits of wood in the field the same permission to gather up all grasses wherever they might grow unless they were in a field that had been sown with fenugreek which needs grass for protection for grafting purposes twigs could be cut from any plant except the olive trees water springs belonged to the whole town it was lawful for any one to catch fish in the sea of tiberias provided navigation was not impeded the area adjacent to the outer side of a fence about a field might be used by any passer-by to ease nature 
from the close of the harvest until the seventeenth day of marcia's schwan fields could be crossed a traveller who lost his way among vineyards could not be held responsible for the damage done in the effort to recover the right path a dead body found in a field was to be buried on the spot where it was found the allotment of the land to the tribes and subdividing each district among the tribesmen took as much time as the conquest of the land when the two tribes and a half from the land beyond jordan returned home after an absence of fourteen years they were not a little astonished to hear that the boys who had been too young to go to the wars with them had in the meantime shown themselves worthy of the fathers they had been successful in repulsing the ishmaelitish tribes who had taken advantage of the absence of the men capable of bearing arms to assault their wives and children after a leadership of twenty-eight years marked with success in war and in peace joshua departed this life his followers laid the knives he had used in circumcising the israelites into his grave and over it they erected a pillar as a memorial of the great wonder of the sun standing still over ajalon however the mourning for joshua was not so great as might justly have been expected the cultivation of the recently conquered land so occupied the attention of the tribes that they came nigh forgetting the man to whom chiefly they owed their possession of it as a punishment for their ingratitude god soon after joshua's death brought also the life of the high priest eleazar and of the other elders to a close and the mount on which joshua's body was interred began to tremble and threaten to engulf the jews end of chapter one joshua chapter two part one of the legends of the jews volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the legends of the jews volume four by lewis ginsburg chapter two the judges part one the first judge after the death of joshua the israelites inquired to god whether they were to go up against the canaanites in war they were given the answer if ye are pure of heart go forth unto the combat but if your hearts are sullied with sin then refrain they inquired furthermore how to test the heart of the people god ordered them to cast lots and set apart those designated by lot for they would be the sinful among them again when the people besought god to give it a guide and leader an angel answered cast lots in the tribe of caleb the lot designated kenaz and he was made prince over israel his first act was to determine by lot who were the sinners in israel and what their inward thought he declared before the people if i and my house be set apart by lot deal with us as we deserve burn us with fire the people assenting lots were cast and three hundred and forty-five of the tribe of judah were singled out five hundred and sixty of reuben seven hundred and seventy-five of simon one hundred and fifty of levi six hundred and sixty-five of issachar five hundred and forty-five of zebulon three hundred and eighty of gad and six hundred and sixty-five of asher four hundred and eighty of manasseh four hundred and forty-eight of ephraim and two hundred and sixty-seven of benjamin so six thousand one hundred and ten persons were confined in prison until god should let it be known what was to be done with them the united prayers of kenaz eleazar the high priest and the elders of the congregation were answered thus ask these men now to confess their iniquity and they shall be burnt with fire kenaz thereupon exhorted them ye know that achan the son of zabdi committed the trespass of taking the anathema but the lot fell upon him and he confessed his sin do ye likewise confess your sins that ye may come to life with those whom god will revive on the day of the resurrection one of the sinful a man by the name of elah said in reply thereto if thou desirest to bring forth the truth address thyself to each of the tribes separately kenaz began with his own the tribe of judah the wicked of judah confessed to the sin of worshipping the golden calf like unto their forefathers in the desert the reubenites had burnt sacrifices to idols 
the levites said we desire to prove whether the tabernacle is holy those of the tribe of issachar replied we consulted idols to know what will become of us the sinners of zebulon we desire to eat the flesh of our sons and daughters to know whether the lord loves them the danites admitted they had taught their children out of the books of the amorites which they had hidden then under mount abarim where kenaz actually found them the naphtalites confessed to the same transgression only they had concealed the books in the tent of elah and there they were found by kenaz the gadites acknowledged having led an immoral life and the sinners of asher that they had found and had hidden under mount shechem the seven golden idols called by the amorites the holy nymphs the same seven idols which had been made in a miraculous way after the deluge by the seven sinners cana put shela nimrod elath diul and shua they were of precious stones from havilah which radiated light making night bright as day besides they possessed a rare virtue if a blind amorite kissed one of the idols and at the same time touched its eyes his sight was restored after the sinners of asher those of manasseh made their confession they had desecrated the sabbath the ephraimites owned to having sacrificed their children to moloch finally the benjamites said we desired to prove whether the law emanated from god or from moses at the command of god these sinners and all their possessions were burnt with fire at the brook of pishon only the amorite books and the idols of precious stones remained unscathed neither fire nor water could do them harm kenaz decided to consecrate the idols to god but a revelation came to him saying if god were to accept what has been declared anathema why should not man he was assured that god would destroy the things over which human hands had no power kenaz acting under divine instruction bore them to the summit of a mountain where an altar was erected the books and the idols were placed upon it and the people offered many sacrifices and celebrated the whole day as a festival during the night following kenaz saw dew rise from the ice in paradise and descend upon the books the letters of their writing were obliterated by it and then an angel came and annihilated what was left during the same night an angel carried off the seven gems and threw them to the bottom of the sea meanwhile a second angel brought twelve other gems engraving the names of the twelve sons of jacob upon them one name upon each no two of these gems were alike the first to bear the name of reuben was like sardius the second for simon like topaz the third levi like emerald the fourth judah like carbuncle the fifth issachar like sapphire the sixth zebulon like jasper the seventh dan like ligure the eighth naphtali like amethyst the ninth gad like agate the tenth asher like chrysolite the eleventh joseph like beryl and the twelfth benjamin like onyx now god commanded kenaz to deposit twelve stones in the holy ark and there they were to remain until such time as solomon should build the temple and attach them to the cherubim furthermore this divine communication was made to kenaz and it shall come to pass when the sin of the children of men shall have been completed by defiling my temple the temple they themselves shall build that i will take these stones together with the tables of the law and put them in the place whence they were removed of old and there they shall remain until the end of all time when i will visit the inhabitants of the earth then i will take them up and they shall be an everlasting light to those who love me and keep my commandments when kenaz bore the stones to the sanctuary they illumined the earth like unto the sun at midday campaigns of kenaz after these preparations kenaz took the field against the enemy with three hundred thousand men the first day he slew eight thousand of the foe and the second day five thousand but not all the people were devoted to kenaz some murmured against him and calumniating him said kenaz stays at home while we expose ourselves on the field the servants of kenaz reported these words to him 
he ordered the thirty-seven men who had railed against him to be incarcerated and he swore to kill them if god would but grant him assistance for the sake of his people thereupon he assembled three hundred men of his attendants supplied them with horses and bade them be prepared to make a sudden attack during the night but to tell none of the plans he harboured in his mind the scouts sent ahead to reconnoitre reported that the amorites were too powerful for him to risk an engagement kenaz however refused to be turned away from his intention at midnight he and his three hundred trusty attendants advanced upon the amorite camp close upon it he commanded his men to halt but to resume their march and follow him when they should hear the notes of the trumpet if the trumpet was not sounded they were to return home alone kenaz ventured into the very camp of the enemy praying to god fervently he asked that a sign be given him let this be the sign of the salvation thou wilt accomplish for me this day i shall draw my sword from its sheath and brandish it so that it glitters in the camp of the amorites if the enemy recognize it as the sword of kenaz then i shall know thou wilt deliver them into my hand if not i shall understand thou hast not granted my prayer but dost propose to deliver me into the hand of the enemy for my sins he heard the amorites say let us proceed to give battle to the israelites for our sacred gods the nymphs are in their hands and will cause their defeat when he heard these words the spirit of god came over kenaz he arose and swung his sword above his head scarce had the amorites seen it gleam in the air when they exclaimed verily this is the sword of kenaz who has come to inflict wounds and pain but we know that our gods who are held by the israelites will deliver them into our hands up then to battle knowing that god had heard his petition kenaz threw himself upon the amorites and mowed down forty-five thousand of them and as many perished at the hands of their own brethren for god had sent the angel gabriel to his aid and he had struck the amorites blind so that they fell upon one another on account of the vigorous blows dealt by kenaz on all sides his sword stuck to his hand a fleeing amorite whom he stopped to ask him how to loose it advised him to slay a hebrew and let his warm blood flow over his hand kenaz accepted his advice but only in part instead of a hebrew he slew the amorite himself and his blood freed his hand from the sword when kenaz came back to his men he found them sunk in profound sleep which had overtaken them that they might not see the wonders done for their leader they were not a little astonished on awakening to behold the whole plain strewn with the dead bodies of the amorites then kenaz said to them are the ways of god like unto the ways of man through me the lord hath sent deliverance to this people arise now and go back to your tents the people recognized that a great miracle had happened and they said now we know that god hath wrought salvation for his people he hath no need of numbers but only of holiness on his return from the campaign kenaz was received with great rejoicing the whole people now gave thanks to god for having put him over them as their leader they desired to know how he had won the great victory kenaz only answered ask those who were with me about my deeds his men were thus forced to confess that they knew nothing only on awakening they had seen the plain full of dead bodies without being able to account for their being there then kenaz turned to the thirty-seven men imprisoned before he left for the war for having cast aspersions upon him well he said what charge have you to make against me seeing that death was inevitable they confessed they were of the sort of sinners whom kenaz and the people had executed and god had now surrendered them to him on account of their misdeeds they too were burnt with fire kenaz reigned for a period of fifty-seven years when he felt his end draw nigh he summoned the two prophets phineas and jabez together with the priest phineas the son of eleazar to these he spake i know the heart of this people it will turn from following after the lord therefore do i testify against it phineas the son of eleazar replied as moses and joshua testified so do i testify against it 
for moses and joshua prophesied concerning the vineyard the beautiful planting of the lord which knew not who had planted it and did not recognize him who cultivated it so that the vineyard was destroyed and brought forth no fruit these are the words my father commanded me to say unto this people kenaz broke out into loud wailing and with him the elders and the people and they wept until eventide saying is it for the iniquity of the sheep that the shepherd must perish may the lord have compassion upon his inheritance that it may not work in vain the spirit of god descended upon kenaz and he beheld a vision he prophesied that this world would continue to exist only seven thousand years to be followed then by the kingdom of heaven these words spoken the prophetical spirit departed from him and he straightway forgot what he had uttered during his vision before he passed away he spoke once more saying if such be the rest which the righteous obtain after their death it were better for them to die than live in this corrupt world and see its iniquities as kenaz left no male heirs zebul was appointed his successor mindful of the great service kenaz had performed for the nation zebul acted a father's part toward the three unmarried daughters of his predecessor at his instance the people assigned a rich marriage portion to each of them they were given great domains as their property the oldest of the three ethema by name he married to elizaphan the second phila to odahel and the youngest zilpah to doel zebul the judge instituted a treasury at shiloh he bade the people bring contributions whether of gold or of silver they were only to take heed not to carry anything thither that had originally belonged to an idol his efforts were crowned with success the free will offerings to the temple treasure amounted to twenty talents of gold and two hundred and fifty talents of silver zebul's reign lasted twenty-five years before his death he admonished the people solemnly to be god-fearing and observant of the law othniel othniel was a judge of a very different type his contemporaries said that before the son of joshua went down the son of othniel his successor in the leadership of the people appeared on the horizon the new leader's real name was judah othniel was one of his epithets as jabez was another among the judges othniel represents the class of scholars his acumen was so great that he was able by dint of dialect reasoning to restore the seventeen hundred traditions which moses had taught the people and which had been forgotten in the time of mourning for moses nor was his zeal for the promotion of the study of the torah inferior to his learning the descendants of jethro left jericho the district assigned to them and journeyed to arad only that they might sit at the feet of othniel his wife the daughter of his half-brother caleb was not so well pleased with him she complained to her father that her husband's house was bare of all earthly goods and his only possession was knowledge of the torah the first event to be noted in othniel's forty years reign is his victory over adonai bezek this chief did not occupy a prominent position among the canaanitish rulers he was not even accounted a king nevertheless he had conquered seventy foreign kings the next event was the capture of luz by the israelites the only way to gain entrance into luz was by a cave and the road to the cave lay through a hollow almond tree if the secret approach to the city had not been betrayed by one of its residents it would have been impossible for the israelites to reach it god rewarded the informer who put the israelites in the way of capturing luz the city he founded was left unmolested both by sennacherib and nebuchadnezzar and not even the angel of death has power over its inhabitants they never die unless weary of life they leave the city the same good fortune did not mark othniel's reign throughout for eight years israel suffered oppression at the hands of cushan the evil-doer who in former days had threatened to destroy the patriarch jacob as he was now endeavouring to destroy the descendants of jacob for cushan is only another name for laban 
othniel however was held so little answerable for the causes that had brought on the punishment of the people that god granted him eternal life he is one of the few who reached paradise alive boaz and ruth the story of ruth came to pass a hundred years after othniel's reign conditions in palestine were of such a nature that if a judge said to a man remove the moat from thine eye his reply was do thou remove the beam from thine own to chastise the israelites god sent down them one of the ten seasons of famine which he had ordained as disciplinary measures for mankind from the creation of the world until the advent of messiah elimelech and his sons who belonged to the aristocracy of the land attempted neither to improve the sinful generation whose transgressions had called forth the famine nor alleviated the distress that prevailed about them they left palestine and thus withdrew themselves from the needy who had counted upon their help they turned their faces to moab there on account of their wealth and high descent they were made officers in the army malon and chilion the sons of elimelech rose to still higher distinction they married the daughters of the moabite king eglon but this did not happen until after the death of elimelech who was opposed to intermarriage with the heathen neither the wealth nor the family connections of the two men helped them before god first they sank into poverty and as they continued in their sinful ways god took their life naomi their mother resolved to return to her home her two daughters-in-law were very dear to her on account of the love they had borne her sons a love strong even in death for they refused to marry again yet she would not take them with her to palestine because she foresaw contemptuous treatment in store for them as moabitish women orpah was easily persuaded to remain behind she accompanied her mother-in-law a distance of four miles and then she took leave of her shedding only four tears as she bade her farewell subsequent events showed that she had not been worthy of entering into the jewish communion for scarcely had she separated from naomi when she abandoned herself to an immoral life but with god nothing goes unrewarded for the four miles which orpah travelled with naomi she was recompensed by bringing forth four giants goliath and his three brothers ruth's bearing in history were far different she was determined to become a jewess and her decision could not be shaken by what naomi in compliance with the jewish injunction told her of the difficulties of the jewish law naomi warned her that the israelites had been enjoined to keep sabbaths and feast days and that the daughters of israel were not in the habit of frequenting the theatres and circuses of the heathen ruth only affirmed her readiness to follow jewish customs and when naomi said we have one torah one law one command the eternal our god is one there is none beside him ruth answered thy people shall be my people thy god my god so the two women journeyed together to bethlehem they arrived there on the very day on which the wife of boaz was buried and the concourse assembled for the funeral saw naomi as she returned to her home ruth supported herself and her mother-in-law sparsely with the ears of grain which she gathered in the fields association with so pious a woman as naomi had already exercised great influence upon her life and ways boaz was astonished to notice that if the reapers let more than two ears fall in spite of her need she did not pick them up for the gleaning assigned to the poor by law does not refer to quantities of more than two ears inadvertently dropped at one time boaz also admired her grace her decorous conduct her modest demeanour when he learned who she was he commanded her for her attachment to judaism to his praise she returned thy ancestors found no delight even in timnah the daughter of a royal house as for me i am a member of a low people abominated by thy god and excluded from the assembly of israel 
for the moment boaz failed to recollect the halakha bearing on the moabites and ammonites a voice from heaven reminded him that only their males were affected by the command of exclusion this he told to ruth and he also told her of a vision he had had concerning her descendants for the sake of the good she had done to her mother-in-law kings and prophets would spring from her womb boaz showed kindness not only to ruth and naomi but also to their dead he took upon himself the decent burial of the remains of elimelech and his two sons all this begot in naomi the thought that boaz harboured the intention of marrying ruth she sought to coax the secret if such there was from ruth when she found that nothing could be elicited from her daughter-in-law she made ruth her partner in a plan to force boaz into a decisive step ruth adhered to naomi's directions in every particular except that she did not wash and anoint herself and put on fine raiment until after she had reached her destination she feared to attract the attention of the lustful if she walked along the road decked out in unusual finery the moral conditions in those days were very reprehensible though boaz was high-born and a man of substance yet he slept on the threshing-floor so that his presence might act as a check upon profligacy in the midst of his sleep boaz was startled to find some one next to him at first he thought it was a demon ruth calmed his disquietude with these words thou art the head of the court thy ancestors were princes thou art thyself an honourable man and a kinsman of my dead husband as for me who am in the flower of my years since i left the home of my parents where homage is rendered unto idols i have been constantly menaced by the dissolute young men around so i have come hither that thou who art the redeemer mayest spread out thy skirt over me boaz gave her the assurance that if his older brother tob failed her he would assume the duties of a redeemer the next day he came before the tribunal of the sanhedrin to have the matter adjusted tob soon made his appearance for an angel led him to the place where he was wanted that boaz and ruth might not have long to wait tob who was not learned in the torah did not know that the prohibition against the moabites had reference only to male therefore he declined to marry ruth so she was taken to wife by the octogenarian boaz ruth herself was forty years old at the time of her second marriage and it was against all expectations that her union with boaz should be blessed with offspring a son obed the pious ruth lived to see the glory of solomon but boaz died on the day after the wedding end of chapter two part one the judges chapter two part two of the legends of the jews volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the legends of the jews volume four by lewis ginsburg chapter two the judges part two deborah not long after ruth another ideal woman arose in israel the prophetess deborah when ehu died there was none to take his place as judge and the people fell off from god and his law god therefore sent an angel to them with the following message out of all the nations on earth i chose a people for myself and i thought so long as the world stands my glory will rest upon them i sent moses unto them my servant to teach them goodness and righteousness but they strayed from my ways and now i will arouse their enemies against them to rule over them and they will cry out because we forsook the ways of our fathers hath this come over us then i will send a woman unto them and she will shine for them as a light for forty years the enemy whom god raised up against israel was jabin the king of hazor who oppressed him sorely 
but worse than the king himself was his general sisera one of the greatest heroes known to history when he was thirty years old he had conquered the whole world at the sound of his voice the strongest of walls fell in a heap and the wild animals in the woods were chained to the spot by fear the proportions of his body were vast beyond description if he took a bath in the river and dived beneath the surface enough fish were caught in his beard to feed a multitude and it required no less than nine hundred horses to draw the chariot in which he rode to rid israel of this tyrant god appointed deborah and her husband barak barak was an ignoramus like most of his contemporaries it was a time singularly deficient to scholars in order to do something meritorious in connection with the divine service he carried candles at his wife's instance to the sanctuary wherefrom he was called lipidoth flames deborah was in the habit of making the wicks on the candles very thick so that they might burn a long time therefore god distinguished her he said thou takest pains to shed light in my house and i will let thy light thy flame shine abroad in the whole land thus it happened that deborah became a prophetess and a judge she dispensed judgment in the open air for it was not becoming that men should visit a woman in her house prophetess though she was she was yet subject to the frailties of her sex her self-consciousness was inordinate she sent for barak to come to her instead of going to him and in her song she spoke more of herself than was seemly the result was that the prophetical spirit departed from her for a time while she was composing her song the salvation of israel was effected only after the people assembled on the mount of judah had confessed their sins publicly before god and besought his help a seven days fast was proclaimed for men and women for young and old then god resolved to help the israelites not for their sakes but for the sake of keeping the oath he had sworn to their forefathers never to abandon their seed therefore he sent deborah unto them the task allotted to deborah and barak to lead the attack upon sisera was by no means slight it is comparable with nothing less than joshua's undertaking to conquer canaan joshua had triumphed over only thirty-one of the sixty-two kings of palestine leaving at large as many as he had subdued under the leadership of sisera these thirty-one unconquered kings opposed israel no less than forty thousand armies each counting a hundred thousand warriors were arrayed against deborah and barak god aided israel with water and fire the river kishon and all the fiery hosts of heaven except the star meros fought against sisera the kishon had long before been pledged to play its part in sisera's overthrow when the egyptians were drowned in the red sea god commanded the angel of the sea to cast their corpses on the land that the israelites might convince themselves of the destruction of their foes and those of little faith might not say afterward that the egyptians like the israelites had reached dry land the angel of the sea complained of the impropriety of withdrawing a gift god mollified him with the promise of future compensation the kishan was offered as security that he would receive half as many bodies again as he was now giving up when sisera's troops sought relief from the scorching fire of the heavenly bodies in the coolness of the waters of the kishan god commanded the river to redeem its pledge and so the heathen were swept down into the sea by the waves of the river kishan whereat the fishes in the sea exclaimed and the truth of the lord endureth for ever sisera's lot was no better than the lot of the men he fled from the battle on horseback after witnessing the annihilation of his vast army when jael saw him approach she went to meet him arrayed in rich garments and jewels she was unusually beautiful and her voice was the most seductive ever a woman possessed these are the words she addressed to him 
enter and refresh thyself with food and sleep until evening and then i will send my attendants with thee to accompany thee for i know thou wilt not forget me and thy recompense will not fail when sisera on stepping into her tent saw the bed strewn with roses which jael had prepared for him he resolved to take her home to his mother as his wife as soon as his safety should be assured he asked her for milk to drink saying my soul burns with the flame which i saw in the stars contending for israel jael went forth to milk her goat meantime supplicating god to grant her his help i pray to thee o lord to strengthen thy maidservant against the enemy by this token shall i know that thou wilt aid me if when i enter the house sisera will awaken and ask for water to drink scarcely had jael crossed the threshold when sisera awakened and begged for water to quench his burning thirst jael gave him wine mixed with water which caused him to drop into a sound sleep again the woman then took a wooden spike in her left hand approaching the sleeping warrior and said this shall be the sign that thou wilt deliver him into my hand if i draw him from the bed down on the ground without awaking him she tugged at sisera and in very truth he did not awaken even when he dropped from the bed to the floor then jael prayed o god strengthen the arm of thy maidservant this day for thy sake for the sake of thy people and for the sake of those that hope in thee with a hammer she drove the spike into the temple of sisera who cried out as he was expiring o oh, that i should lose my life by the hand of a woman jael's mocking retort was descend to hell and join thy fathers and tell them that thou didst fall by the hand of a woman barak took charge of the body of the dead warrior and he sent it to sisera's mother Themac, with the message here is thy son whom thou didst expect to see returning laden with booty he had in mind the vision of Themac and her women in waiting when sisera went forth to battle their conjuring tricks had shown him to them as he lay on the bed of a jewish woman this they had interpreted to mean that he would return with jewish captives one damsel two damsels for every man they had said great therefore was the disappointment of sisera's mother no less than a hundred cries did she utter over him deborah and barak thereupon intoned a song of praise thanking god for the deliverance of israel out of the power of sisera and reviewing the history of the people since the time of abraham after laboring for the weal of her nation for forty years deborah departed this life her last words to the weeping people were an exhortation not to depend upon the dead they can do nothing for the living so long as a man is alive his prayers are efficacious for himself and for others they avail naught once he is dead the whole nation kept a seventy days period of mourning in honour of deborah and the land was at peace for seven years gideon elated by the victory over sisera israel sang a hymn of praise the song of deborah and god to reward them for their pious sentiments pardoned the transgression of the people but they soon slipped back into the old ways and the old troubles harassed them their backsliding was due to the witchcraft of a midianite priest named Aud he made the sun shine at midnight and so convinced the israelites that the idols of midian were mightier than god and god chastised them by delivering them into the hands of the midianites they worshipped their own images reflected in the water and they were stricken with dire poverty they could not bring so much as a meal offering the offering of the poor on the eve of one passover gideon uttered the complaint where are all the wondrous works which god did for our fathers in this night when he slew the firstborn of the egyptians and israel went forth from slavery with joyous hearts god appeared unto him and said thou who art courageous enough to champion israel thou art worthy that israel should be saved for thy sake an angel appeared and gideon begged him for a sign that he would achieve the deliverance of israel 
he excused his petition with the precedent of moses the first prophet who likewise had had asked for a sign the angel bade him pour water on the rock and then gave him the choice of how he would have the water transformed gideon desired to see one half changed into blood and one half into fire thus it happened the blood and the fire mingled with each other yet the blood did not quench the fire nor did the fire dry out the blood encouraged by this and other signs gideon undertook to carry on the war against the midianites with a band of three hundred god-fearing men and he was successful of the enemy one hundred and twenty thousand corpses covered the field and all the rest fled precipitately gideon enjoyed the privilege of bringing salvation to israel because he was a good son his old father feared to thresh his grain on account of the midianites and gideon once went out to him in the field and said father thou art too old to do this work go thou home and i shall finish thy task for thee if the midianites should surprise me out here i can run away which thou canst not do on account of thy age the day on which gideon gained his great victory was during the passover and the cake of barley bread that turned the camp of the enemy upside down of which the midianite dreamed was a sign that god would espouse the cause of his people to reward them for bringing a cake of barley bread as an omer offering after god had favoured israel with great help through him gideon had an ephod made in the high priest's breastplate joseph was represented among the twelve tribes by ephraim alone not by manasseh too to wipe out this slight upon his own tribe gideon made an ephod bearing the name of manasseh he consecrated it to god but after his death homage was paid to it as an idol in those days the israelites were so addicted to the worship of beelzebub that they constantly carried small images of this god with them in their pockets and every now and then they were in the habit of bringing the image forth and kissing it fervently of such idolaters were the vain and light fellows who helped abimelech the son of gideon by his concubine from shechem to assassinate the other sons of his father but god is just as abimelech murdered his brothers upon a stone so abimelech himself met his death through a millstone it was proper then that jotham in his parable should compare abimelech to a thorn-bush while he characterized his predecessors othniel deborah and gideon as an olive-tree or a fig-tree or a vine this jotham the youngest of the sons of gideon was more than a teller of parables he knew then that long afterward the samaritans would claim sanctity for mount gerizim on account of the blessing pronounced from it upon the tribe for this reason he chose gerizim from which to hurl his curse upon shechem and its inhabitants the successor to abimelech equalled if he did not surpass him in wickedness jair erected an altar unto baal and on penalty of death he forced the people to prostrate themselves before it only seven men remained firm in the true faith and refused to the last to commit idolatry their names were duel abbot israel jacothiel shalom ashur jehonadab and shemiel they said to jair we are mindful of the lessons given us by our teachers and our mother deborah take ye heed they said that your heart lead you not astray to the right or to the left day and night ye shall devote yourselves to the study of the torah why then dost thou seek to corrupt the people of the lord saying baal is god let us worship him if he really is what thou sayest then let him speak like a god and we will pay him worship for the blasphemy they had uttered against baal jair commanded that the seven men be burnt when his servants were about to carry out his order god sent the angel nathaniel the lord over the fire and he extinguished the fire though not before the servants of jair were consumed by it not only did the seven men escape the danger of suffering death by fire but the angel enabled them to flee unnoticed by striking all the people present with blindness then the angel approached jair and said to him hear the words of the lord ere thou diest 
i appointed thee as prince over my people and thou didst break my covenant seduce my people and seek to burn my servants with fire but they were animated and freed by the living the heavenly fire as for thee thou wilt die and die by fire a fire in which thou wilt abide for ever thereupon the angel burnt him with a thousand men whom he had taken in the act of paying homage to baal jephthah the first judge of any importance after gideon was jephthah he too fell short of being the ideal jewish ruler his father had married a woman of another tribe an unusual occurrence in a time when a woman who left her tribe was held in contempt jephthah the offspring of this union had to bear the consequences of his mother's irregular conduct so many annoyances were put upon him that he was forced to leave his home and settle in a heathen district at first jephthah refused to accept the rulership which the people offered him in an assembly at mizpah for he had not forgotten the wrongs to which he had been subjected in the end however he yielded and placed himself at the head of the people in the war against jetal the king of the ammonites at his departure he vowed before god to sacrifice to him whatsoever came forth out of the doors of his house to meet him when he returned a victor from the war god was angry and said so jephthah has vowed to offer unto me the first thing that shall meet him if a dog were the first to meet him would a dog be sacrificed to me now shall the vow of jephthah be visited on his firstborn on his own offspring yea his prayer shall be visited on his only daughter but i assuredly shall deliver my people not for jephthah's sake but for the sake of the prayers of israel the first to meet him after his successful campaign was his daughter shelah overwhelmed by anguish the father cried out rightly was the name shelah the one who is demanded given to thee that thou shouldst be offered up as a sacrifice who shall set my heart in the balance and my soul as the weight that i may stand and see whether that which happened to me is joy or sorrow but because i opened my mouth to the lord and uttered a vow i cannot take it back then shelah spoke saying why dost thou grieve for my death since the people was delivered dost thou not remember what happened in the day of our forefathers when the father offered his son as a burnt offering and the son did not refuse but consented gladly and the offerer and the offered were both full of joy therefore do as thou hast spoken but before i die i will ask a favour of thee grant me that i may go with my companions upon the mountains sojourn among the hills and tread upon the rocks to shed my tears and deposit there the grief for my lost youth the trees of the field shall weep for me and the beasts of the field mourn for me i do not grieve for my death nor because i have to yield up my life but because when my father vowed his heedless vow he did not have me in mind i fear therefore that i may not be an acceptable sacrifice and that my death shall be for nothing sheila and her companions went forth and told her case to the sages of the people but none of them could give her any help then she went up to mount telag where the lord appeared to her at night saying unto her i have closed the mouth of the sages of my people in this generation that they cannot answer the daughter of jephthah a word that my vow be fulfilled and nothing of what i have thought remain undone i know her to be wiser than her father and all the wise men and now her soul shall be accepted at her request and her death shall be very precious before my face all the time sheila began to bewail her fate in these words hearken ye mountains to my lamentations and ye hills to the tears of my eyes and ye rocks testify to the weeping of my soul my words will go up to heaven and my tears will be written in the firmament i have not been granted the joy of wedding nor was the wreath of my betrothal completed i have not been decked with ornaments nor have i been scented with myrrh and with aromatic perfumes i have not been anointed with the oil that was prepared for me alas o mother it was in vain thou didst give birth to me the grave was destined to be my bridal chamber the oil thou didst prepare for me will be spilled and the white garments my mother sewed for me the moth will eat them 
the bridal wreath my nurse wound for me will wither and my garments in blue and purple the worms will destroy them and my companions will all their days lament over me and now ye trees incline your branches and weep over my youth ye beasts of the forest come and trample upon my virginity for my years are cut off and the days of my life grow old in darkness her lamentations were of as little avail as her arguments with her father in vain she sought to prove to him from the torah that the law speaks only of animal sacrifices never of human sacrifices in vain she cited the example of jacob who had vowed to give god a tenth of all the possessions he owned and yet did not attempt later to sacrifice one of his sons jephthah was inexorable all he would yield was a respite during which his daughter might visit various scholars who were to decide whether he was bound by his vow according to the torah his vow was entirely invalid he was not even obliged to pay his daughter's value in money but the scholars of his time had forgotten this halakha and they decided that he must keep his vow the forgetfulness of the scholars was of god ordained as a punishment upon jephthah for having slaughtered thousands of ephraim one man there was living at the time who if he had been questioned about the case would have been able to give a decision this was the high priest phineas but he said proudly what i a high priest the son of a high priest should humiliate myself and go to an ignoramus jephthah on the other hand said what i the chief of the tribes of israel the first prince of the land should humiliate myself and go to one of the rank and file so only the rivalry between jephthah and phineas caused the loss of a young life their punishment did not miss them jephthah dies a horrible death limb by limb his body was dismembered as for the high priest the holy spirit departed from him and he had to give up his priestly dignity as it had been jephthah's task to ward off the ammonites so his successor abdon was occupied with protecting israel against the moabites the king of moab sent messengers to abdon and they spoke thus thou well knowest that israel took possession of cities that belonged to me return them abdon's reply was know ye not how the ammonites fared the measure of moab's sins it seems out against the enemy slew forty-five thousand of their number and routed the rest samson the last judge but one samson was not the most important of the judges but he was the greatest hero of the period and except goliath the greatest hero of all times he was the son of manoah of the tribe of dan and his wife zelalpanit of the tribe of judah and he was born to them at a time when they had given up all hope of having children samson's birth is a striking illustration of the short-sightedness of human beings the judge ibzan had not invited manoah and zelalpanit to any of the one hundred and twenty feasts in honour of the marriage of his sixty children which were celebrated at his house and at the house of their parents-in-law because he thought that the sterile she-mule would never be in a position to repay his courtesy it turned out that samson's parents were blessed with an extraordinary son while ibzan saw his sixty children die during his lifetime samson's strength was superhuman and the dimensions of his body were gigantic he measured sixty ells between the shoulders yet he had one imperfection he was maimed in both feet the first evidence of his gigantic strength he gave when he uprooted two great mountains and rubbed them against each other such feats he was able to perform as often as the spirit of god was poured out over him whenever this happened it was indicated by his hair it began to move and emit a bell-like sound which could be heard far off besides while the spirit rested upon him he was able with one stride to cover a distance equal to that between zora and eshtaal it was samson's supernatural strength that made jacob think that he would be the messiah when god showed him samson's latter end then he realized that the new era would not be ushered in by the hero judge samson won his first victory over the philistines by means of the jawbone of the ass on which abraham had made his way to mount moriah it had been preserved miraculously after this victory a great wonder befell samson was at the point of perishing from thirst when water began to flow from his own mouth as from a spring 
besides physical prowess samson possessed also spiritual distinctions he was unselfish to the last degree he had been of exceeding great help to the israelites but he never asked the smallest service for himself when samson told delilah that he was a nazarite unto god she was certain that he had divulged the true secret of his strength she knew his character too well to entertain the idea that he would couple the name of god with an untruth there was a weak side to his character too he allowed sensual pleasures to dominate him the consequences was that he who went astray after his eyes lost his eyes even this severe punishment produced no change of heart he continued to lead his old life of profligacy in prison and he was encouraged thereto by the philistines who set aside all considerations of family purity in the hope of descendants who should be the equals of samson in giant strength and stature as throughout life samson had given proofs of superhuman power so in the moment of death he entreated god to realize in him the blessing of jacob and endow him with divine strength he expired with these words upon his lips o master of the world vouchsafe unto me in this life a recompense for the loss of one of my eyes for the loss of the other i will wait to be rewarded in the world to come even after his death samson was a shield unto the israelites fear of him had so cowed the philistines that for twenty years they did not dare attack the israelites the crime of the benjamites a part of the money which delilah received from the philistine lords as the price of samson's secret she gave to her son micah and he used it to make an idol for himself this sin was the more unpardonable as micah owed his life to a miracle performed by moses during the times of the egyptian oppression if the prescribed number of bricks was not furnished by the israelites their children were used as building material such would have been micah's fate if he had not been saved in a miraculous way moses wrote down the name of god and put the words on micah's body the dead boy came to life and moses drew him out of the wall of which he made a part micah did not show himself worthy of the wonder done for him even before the israelites left egypt he made his idol and it was he who fashioned the golden calf at the time of othniel the judge he took up his abode at a distance of not more than three miles from the sanctuary at shiloh and won over the grandson of moses to officiate as priest before his idol the sanctuary which micah erected harbored various idols he had three images of boys and three of calves one lion an eagle a dragon and a dove when a man came who wanted a wife he was directed to appeal to the dove if riches were his desire he worshipped the eagle for daughters both to the calves to the lion for strength and to the dragon for long life sacrifices and incense alike were offered to these idols and both had to be purchased with cash money from micah even didrachms for a sacrifice and one for incense the rapid degeneration in the family of moses may be accounted for by the fact that moses had married the daughter of a priest who ministered to idols yet the grandson of moses was not an idolater of ordinary calibre his sinful conduct was not without a semblance of morality from his grandfather he had heard the rule that a man should do a boda zera for hire rather than be dependent upon his fellow creatures the meaning of a boda zara here naturally is strange in the sense of unusual work but he took the term in its ordinary acceptation of service of strange gods so far from being a whole-souled idolater he adopted methods calculated to harm the cause of idol worship whenever any one came leading an animal with the intention of sacrificing it he would say what good can the idol do thee it can neither see nor hear nor speak but as he was concerned about his own livelihood and did not want to offend the idolaters too grossly he would continue if thou bringest a dish of flour and a few eggs it will suffice this offering he would himself eat under david he filled the position of treasurer david appointed him because he thought that a man who was willing to become priest to an idol only in order to earn his bread must be worthy of confidence 
however sincere his repentance may have been he relapsed into his former life when he was removed from his office by solomon who filled all position with new incumbents at his accession to the throne finally he abandoned his idolatrous ways wholly and became so pure a man that he was favoured by god with the gift of prophecy this happened on the day on which the man of god out of judah came to jeroboam for the grandson of moses is none other than the old prophet at bethel who invited the man of god out of judah to come to his house the mischief done by micah spread further and further especially the benjamites distinguished themselves for their zeal in paying homage to his idols god therefore resolved to visit the sins of israel and benjamin upon them the opportunity did not delay to come it was not long before the benjamites committed the outrage of gibeah before the house of bethac a venerable old man that imitated the disgraceful conduct of the sodomites before the house of lot when the other tribes exacted amends from the benjamites and were denied satisfaction bloody combats ensued at first the benjamites prevailed in spite of the fact that the urim and thummim questioned by phineas had encouraged the israelites to take up the conflict with the words up to war i shall deliver them into your hands after the tribes had again and again suffered defeat they recognized the intention of god to betray them as a punishment for their sins they therefore ordained a day of fasting and convocation before the holy ark and phineas the son of eleazar entreated god in their behalf what means this that thou leadest us astray is the deed of the benjamites right in thine eyes then why didst thou not command us to desist from the combat but if what our brethren have done is evil in thy sight then why dost thou cause us to fall before them in battle o god of our fathers hearken unto my voice make it known this day unto thy servant whether the war waged with benjamin is pleasing in thine eyes or whether thou desirest to punish thy people for its sins then the sinners among us will amend their ways i am mindful of what happened in the days of my youth at the time of moses in the zeal of my soul i slew two for the sin of zimri and when his well-wishers sought to kill me thou didst send an angel who cut off twenty-four thousand of them and delivered me but now eleven of thy tribes have gone forth to do thy bidding to avenge and slay and lo they have themselves been slain so that they are made to believe that thy revelations are lying and deceitful o lord god of our forefathers naught is hidden before thee make it manifest why this misfortune has overtaken us god replied to phineas at great length setting forth why eleven tribes had suffered so heavily the lord had wanted to punish them for having permitted micah and his mother delilah to pursue their evil ways undisturbed though they were zealous beyond measure in avenging the wrong done to the woman at gibeah as soon as all those had perished who were guilty of having aided and abetted micah in his idolatrous practices whether directly or indirectly god was willing to help them in their conflicts with the benjamites so it came in the battle fought soon after seventy-five thousand benjamites fell slain only six hundred of the tribe survived fearing to remain in palestine the small band emigrated to italy and germany at the same time the punishment promised them by god overtook the two chief sinners micah lost his life by fire and his mother rotted alive worms crawled from her body in spite of the great mischief caused by micah he had one good quality and god permitted it to plead for him when the angel stood up against him as his accusers he was extremely hospitable his house always stood wide open to the wanderer and to his hospitality he owed it that he was granted a share in the future world in hell micah is the first in the sixth division which is under the guidance of the angel hadriel and he is the only one in the division who has spared hell tortures micah's son was jeroboam whose golden calves were sinful far beyond anything his father had done in those days god spake to phineas thou art one hundred and twenty years old thou hast reached the natural term of man's life go now betake thyself to the mountain danabin 
and remain there many years i will command the eagles to sustain thee with food so that thou returnest not to men until the time when thou lockest fast the clouds and openest them again then i will carry thee to the place where those are who were before thee and there thou wilt tarry until i visit the world and bring thee thither to taste of death End of chapter two part two the judges